boom, the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, there's no need for a song because this is the real deal. But what is the fundamental theorem of calculus about? Well, it will tell us that integration and differentiation are really inverse processes. So remember that on the one hand, we defined derivatives as being limits of difference quotients, and on the other hand, we defined definite integrals as being limits of Riemann sums. So these are very different things. But it turns out that if you start with a function, integrate it, and then differentiate it, you go back to the original function. And similarly, if you start with a function, differentiate it first, and then integrate it, you also go back to the original function in a very precise sense. And this is the core of the fundamental theorem of calculus. But as a consequence, it will also give us a way of evaluating definite integrals, which is much, much faster than by evaluating limits of Riemann sums. So we're going to evaluate them in terms of antiderivatives. All right, so this is exciting. We're going to see something important today. So let's get started. To formulate uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we will generally write as FTC, we need to study the function given by the integral of f of t between a and x. So let's start by trying to understand what this function is calculating. So my first question is, is this function a function of x or t? Well, let's see. So let's first fix x. So let's just consider the integral from a to b of f of t dt. Well, we know what this is calculating, right? If my function is somewhere like here, and a and b are here, then the integral here, the definite integral, is calculating the net area under the curve. So this is calculating the net area, which is really just a number. Whatever the number is, it's just a number. All right, but what I want to do here is let the upper limit of integration vary. So instead of fixing it to be b, I'll let it vary, so I give it a name called x. Right, so I'll look at a whole bunch of different limits of integration here. So for different values of x, I'll be calculating different net areas, right? So this is saying that for any value of x, I'll get different numbers. So mathematically, what this is saying is that this expression here is a function of x. For different values of x, I'll get different numbers. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so it's not a function of t, it's a function of x. And let's check whether this is correct by just looking at a simple example where we know how to integrate. So let's just consider the function, the integral from a to x, of the function 1 times dt. So using properties of definite integrals, we actually know what this is. This is just going to be x minus a. And indeed, what you get is a function of x, not a function of t. OK, that's cool. So just before uh, we keep going, I want to remark something about notation here. So I've used different symbols for the upper limit of integration here, x, and the variable over which I'm integrating here, t. That's very important that you use different symbols. Otherwise, it gets very confusing. t here is a variable that we're integrating over, so it's kind of a dummy variable. The expression, the final expression, does not depend on t because you've integrated over it, while x here is the variable limit of integration, so the result is indeed a function of x. So do not use the same variable to denote the two things because they are very different. Okay, so we are now ready to state the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let f of x be a continuous function over some interval a to b, and define the new function g of x that we introduced in the previous slide, namely the integral of f of t from a to x. And I'm going to require that x is uh, between a and b, so it's in the interval where f is continuous. Then the statement is that g of x, the new function, is continuous and differentiable, but most importantly, its derivative, g prime of x, gives you back the integrand f of x, the original function f of x. So in other words, d dx of the integral of f of t between a and x gives you back the integrand f of x. So this is the first part of the statement, and it's really saying that integration and differentiation are inverse processes. right? If you look at that statement, what you're doing here, you start with a function f of t, you first integrate it between a and x, and then you differentiate it, and you recover the original function f of x. So in a precise sense, integrating and differentiation are inverse processes. All right, so let's first check that this uh, works for a very simple function. So I'm going to go back to my example where I take the integral from a to x of the function 1. And what the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 is saying is that if I take the derivative of this new function with respect to x, I'll just recover the integrand as a function of x, which in this case is just 1 because it's a constant function. Now, is that true? Well, in this case, we can check this explicitly because we know how to integrate 1, right? We've seen that this integral here is just x minus a. So if I take the derivative with respect to x on both sides, 
then indeed on the right hand side I'll just get 1. So I recover the statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, but this is not so useful, but it happens uh, pretty often that, in fact, functions are defined as integrals and that you don't really know how to integrate them explicitly. So you cannot do these steps here. You have to use the fundamental theorem of calculus directly. So an example of that, there's many examples, but an example is the Fresnel function, which appears a lot in physics, most, uh, more, more specifically in optics. So what is this? Well, it is actually a function which is defined, indeed, as an integral. So it's defined as the integral from 0 to x, of sine of pi t square over 2 dt. And it turns out that this is the best way of writing the function. You don't really know how to write that down uh, in any other ways than just as an integral of another function. So that, that happens pretty often. And when if you're dealing with such a function, you may be interested in calculating the derivative of that function. And the only way you can do it is using the fundamental theorem of calculus. right? So FTC in this case would tell us that s prime of x which is the derivative of the integral from 0 to x of sine of pi t square over 2 dt. This will just be equal to the integrand as a function of x. So this is sine of pi x square over 2. And I can calculate that without having to integrate because this is the statement of the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so what I want to do now is give you a proof of the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now the proof is quite involved, but it is so essential, it's so fundamental to calculus that I want to go through it step by step with you. Okay, so what are we trying to prove? So we define this new function g of x, and we want to prove that its derivative gives us back the original function f of x. All right, so let's start with the definition of the derivative. So we know that the derivative of g of x will be the limit as h goes to zero of the difference quotient. So let me first study the difference quotient, which is g of x plus h minus g of x, and the whole thing over h. All right, so I can rewrite that in terms of the definition of the function g of x. What will I get? So I get 1 over h, and then I get the integral from a to x plus h of f of t dt minus the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Right, so if I look at it from the point of view of the graph, so I have two points here, x and x plus h. So the first integral here is calculating the area, the net area under the graph here, which I shade in blue, while the second integral is also calculating the net area, but now from a to x. Right, so taking the difference between these two, you see right away from the graph should give us the area here under the graph of the function, but between x and x plus h. So let's prove that this is correct. So I can use properties of definite integrals to rewrite that as follows. So I'm going to introduce now point x between x between a and x plus h, and we write the first integral as the sum of these two integrals, which I can do by properties of definite integrals. But then you see that the first one cancels with the last one. So I indeed end up with the statement that the difference quotient here is 1 over h times the integral from x to x plus h of the function f of t dt. So indeed, this is the area which is shaded in red on the graph. All right, and what I need to prove now, so what I want to prove is that this, the limit of this expression, of this expression here, gives me back the function f of x. Right, so this is what I want to prove. All right, so this is a little involved, but let's first just give a kind of heuristic argument of why this is true. So if you look back at the graph, uh, this expression here, well, the integral here, I guess, cal calculates the area here, the area in red. Now, if I'm taking h to be very small, which is what I'll do when I take the limit, I can approximate this area as being the area of a rectangle, right? So as h goes to zero, the integral here becomes which is the area of a rectangle, so it becomes approximated by the width, which is just h, times the height, which is the value of the function at the right end point, which is x plus h. So in other words, this implies that 1 over h times the integral as h goes to zeros, 0 uh, becomes just f of x plus h, but then as h goes to 0, this will go to f of x.
right? So this is just a heuristic argument, but you see that and it makes sense. This is what you expect. The difference quotient here as x goes to zero will give you back f of x, which is the statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus. But how can we prove that rigorously? How can we prove that this expression, the limit as h goes to zero of this expression gives f of x? All right, so how can I prove rigorously that the limit as h goes to zero of this expression is precisely equal to f of x? Well, the idea will be to use the squeeze theorem. So in other words, I'll want to squeeze this uh, function of h here between two other functions of h that are such that their limit as h goes to zero both converge towards f of x. And if I can do that, then by squeeze theorem, the limit of this expression will also be equal to f of x. And how do I get the inequalities that I will need for the squeeze theorem? Well, the idea will be to use uh, comparison properties for definite integrals that we saw in a previous lecture. All right, so let's get started. So I have a point x and a point x plus h here, and I will want to integrate my function f of t between these two points. So I'm calculating the net area under the curve here. Now, uh, there's something here that uh, is called the extreme value theorem, which we haven't seen yet, which we need to start uh, the process here. But the result of that theorem is pretty simple, so let me just state it. So what the theorem is saying is that for any continuous function, which is defined over some closed interval, then the function will take a maximum and a minimum value over that interval. So for that particular example of a function, for the, the minimum value over the interval here would be here, and I'm going to call that little m. And the maximum value would be somewhere here, which I'll call capital M. But we know that for any continuous function, it will have a maximum and a minimum value over the closed interval. Okay, and then I can use comparison properties for definite integrals. Right, so the integral between x and x plus h of f of t dt, we know is calculating the net area under the curve. And just looking at the picture, we see that this area will be greater or equal than the area of this rectangle here which is just little m times the width, which turns out to be h. And it will be less or equal than the area of the rectangle in red, which is capital M times h. And in fact, I know more than that because I know that little m is actually the value of the function f for some point u, whatever it is, but u is going to be some point over the closed interval, so between x and x plus h. And similarly, capital M will be the output of the function f for some v, which is somewhere over that interval. All right, so I get these inequalities. Now let me divide them by h so that I have inequalities for the expression here. So I'm going to assume that h is greater than 0, but you can do the exact same process, uh, very similar proof for h being less than 0. So I'll leave that as an exercise. But if you assume that h is positive, then I can divide the inequalities here without changing them. And then I get that f of u is less or equal than 1 over h times the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt, which is less or equal than f of v for some u and v over the closed interval, corresponding to the maximum or minimum and maximum value of the function. All right, and then I want to use the squeeze theorem. So I want to take the limit as h goes to 0. But what do I know about the limit of f of u and f of v? Well, I certainly know something about that, right? The limit as h goes to 0 of f of u, well, if h goes to 0, the interval here becomes just a point. It becomes just x, right? So any point here will go towards x. So u will go towards x. So f of u, so in other words, the limit as h goes to 0 of f of u is the same as the limit as u goes to x of f of u, which, because the function is continuous, is just equal to f of x. And the exact same thing is true for v, so the limit as h goes to 0 of f of v is just equal to the limit as v goes to x of f of v, and the function is continuous, so this is equal to f of x. So in other words, I have a function here which is squeezed between two functions that are such that the limit of both uh, f of u and f of v are equal to f of x. So I can conclude right away by squeeze theorem that the limit of the expression in the middle will also be equal to f of x, in other words, the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h, integral of x to x plus h, f of t dt, is precisely equal to f of x, which is the statement of the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. What a beautiful proof. All right, so that was tough. But the good thing is, now that we've proved the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can move on to the second part, which is by far the most useful of the two.
So what is the statement of part 2 of the FTC? So let f of x be a continuous function over some interval, then the statement is that the definite integral of this function from a to b will be equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a, where capital F is an arbitrary antiderivative of little f. So in other words, the derivative of capital F of x gives you back the original function. So a bit of notation. So the expression here for the right side of the equality just stands for what is uh, in front here, namely that uh, this stands for evaluating the function capital F at x equals to b minus the evaluation of the function capital F at x equals to a. All right, so what does uh, this uh, part two of the FTC mean? So remember that part one was basically the statement that if you first integrate and then differentiate, you get back the original function. So part two is kind of the inverse process where you first differentiate and then integrate and get back the original function. Now it may not be so obvious here, but see that you can rewrite the left hand side because capital F is an arbitrary anti derivative of f, we could certainly rewrite the integral on the left hand side as being the integral of capital F prime of x dx, right, because capital F prime is little f of x. So now you see what the statement is, so you start with capital F, differentiate it, integrate it, and you get back capital F. So this is what part 2 of the FTC means. Another way of understanding what it means is the following. So remember that we can write the general antiderivative of a function as the indefinite integral. So I could rewrite this expression here as being the indefinite integral of my function f of x dx evaluated between a and b, namely the indefinite integral at b minus the indefinite integral at a. All right, so this is just the same statement because this statement is valid for arbitrary antiderivatives and in particular is valid for the general antiderivative or the indefinite integral. So you see now that it makes sense to use, to use the same symbol for denoting antiderivatives or indefinite integrals and definite integrals because the two are related by the part two of the FTC. All right, but the reason why part two of the FTC is so useful is that it gives us a way of evaluating definite integrals. Remember that these are defined in terms of limits of Riemann sums, which, and it's very, very tedious to evaluate these limits. While here, all you have to do is find an antiderivative, which is uh, much easier in many cases, not always, but in many cases. And once you have an antiderivative, then you just evaluate it at the uh, limits of integration to get the result for the definite integral. So it is a very, very useful statement in practice. All right, so let's see how we can use FTC part two in practice to evaluate definite integrals. Suppose that I want to calculate the integral between one and two of the function, say six plus x squared dx. So the idea for using the FTC is to first find an antiderivative of the integrand and then evaluate it at two minus uh, its evaluation at one. So I'll first write down square brackets here where I'm going to put my antiderivative and then a 1 and a 2 here, meaning that I'll then evaluate it at 2 minus its evaluation at 1. So I need to find an antiderivative of 6 plus x squared. So an antiderivative of 6 is 6x, while an antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3. If I wanted to write down the general antiderivative, I would have to uh, add an integration constant here, but the FTC part 2 is valid for an arbitrary, so any antiderivative, so in particular I can choose the constant here to be 0, and that's fine. Okay, and then I need to evaluate at 2 minus the evaluation at 1, so I get 6 times 2 plus 2 cubed over 3 minus 6 times 1 plus 1 over 3, so in other words I get 12 plus 8 over 3 minus 6 minus 1 third, which gives me 6 plus 7 third, or in other words, 25 over 3. So you see that this is a very fast way of evaluating definite integrals. In fact, it's a good exercise if you want to. You can try to evaluate this integral using Riemann sums. It is possible in this case, but you see that it's a lot more tedious. So this is much, much faster than using limits of Riemann sums. All right, so let me now prove the FTC part 2. Fortunately, the proof is a lot easier than for part 1 of the FTC. Okay, so I introduce a function g of x as before, which is the integral of f of t dt from a to x. And what I want to prove is that if I set the upper limit of integration here to be equal to b, namely if I evaluate my function at x equals to b, I want to get capital F of b minus capital F of a for arbitrary antiderivatives capital F of little f. This is the statement of part 2 of the FTC. All right, so how can I prove that? Well, I'm going to use part 1. So what part 1 is saying, remember, is that the derivative, so g prime, of x 
is equal to the integrand f of x. So in words, what this is saying is that g of x is an antiderivative of f of x. Okay, that's cool. Now the next step is to pick an arbitrary antiderivative of little well, f of x. And I'm going to call it capital F of x. This is arbitrary, so it can be any antiderivative of f. But what do I know? Well, I know that any two antiderivatives will be related by a constant. So I know that g of x, which is not arbitrary, this is defined in this way, should be equal to capital F of x plus some constant that needs to be fixed. That constant will depend on the choice of antiderivative capital F of x. But I can certainly fix it because I know that if I evaluate my function here g at x equals to a, what will I get? Well, by definition, I get the integral of little f of t dt between a and a, which is clearly zero by properties of definite integral. So this is telling me now from the right-hand side that capital F of a plus the constant should be equal to zero. Or in other words, I fixed my constant to be equal to minus capital F of a. From which I conclude that g of x is equal to capital F of x plus c, which is now minus capital F of a. And in particular, if I evaluate at x equals to b, I get that g of b, which remember is just the integral of f of t dt between a and b, is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a, which is the statement of part 2 of the FTC. All right, so that proof was a lot easier because we already had proved part 1. The main, the core of the fundamental theorem calculus is to prove the first part, which was not so straightforward. All right, so let me end this video by summarizing the fundamental theorem of calculus in all its glory. So let f be a continuous function on some interval, then the first part of the FTC is saying that the derivative ddx of the integral between a and x of f of t gives you back f of x. So in other words, if you first integrate and then differentiate, you go back to the original function in a precise sense. And the second part is saying that the definite integral from a to b of f of x is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a, where capital F is any antiderivative of little f. So what this is saying is that if you differentiate first and then integrate, you also go back to the original function in a precise sense. All right, so this is extremely important. So the first part is going to be useful whenever you're given a function in integral form, but the second part is by far the most useful of the two because it gives you a way of evaluating definite integrals without having to calculate the limits of a Riemann sum. So trust me, from now on you're going to use part two all the time.